Good afternoon and welcome to this ISAP partnership webinar from Nine Consulting, um, titled Demonstrating Accountability with the PDPA. My name is Mark Orchison. I'm the founder and CEO of Nine. And joining me today is Andrew Chung, Senior Compliance Consultant at Nine, and also Vaughan Pope from, um, from NIST, um, who will be doing Q&A later on. Um, the agenda today is going to be um, talking about what uh, demonstrable accountability is, what sort of schools, uh, what sort of things a school should do, what are the mistakes to avoid. Um, we've got a Q and A with with Vaughan, and then we've got um, a lot more time this week for questions than we had last week. So I really encourage you throughout the course of the presentation to really add in um, the questions into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye. Um, and we'll be answering those to myself, Vaughan and Andrew um, for hopefully the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So plenty of time for you to ask your questions, both to the Nine team and also Vaughan, um, who has been working on their uh, PDPA compliance program for um, the, you know, for well over, well over a year. At the bottom of the slide, you will see a, um, a link um, that may look familiar. Um, that takes you to a page on the um, on our website where you can register your interest into the April training program. So if you look back at the proposal document that was issued out by ISAP, there's a program um, that we are commencing in April um, that follows the nine framework and we take a cohort of you through weekly training in terms of the things you need to get done and provide you the resources to do so. It's a very low cost way that you can train your staff, um, but we do need eight schools to sign up by March the 31st, otherwise the training program won't take place. So if you're thinking of doing that, please visit that URL and register that you're going to be signing up for it. I think it's um, uh, 1,950 pounds per school um, and it'll be led by one of the consultancy team at nine. The other thing to say is there is a follow-up email um, coming to you today. And we have a new uh, training video for you um, that links to the topic of accountability and talks you through the nine privacy framework. So whilst you've got the PDF of the framework, um, the, the video really brings to life what that means and, and what, you, what you need to do. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to, to Andrew to get started on um, demonstrating accountability with the PDPA in Thailand. Thanks, Mark. Greetings, everybody. Welcome. Uh, good to join you today. You'll notice the first bullet point on this slide is following the nine framework. So we're going to talk a lot about that. And the general topic that we have for you today is about demonstrating accountability. So we'll talk a little bit about theory and then we're going to talk a lot about practice because this is about demonstrating uh, what this is about, what it looks like and how you do it in your school. So let me flip through. We're going to spend a good 25, 30 minutes on the next few slides. Let's start with some definitions of accountability. So one of those long words that appears in multiple areas of um, of life in business, organizations, charity schools, whatever. And in the context of privacy laws, it's actually right at the heart of many of them. There is this core principle that's either explicitly stated as it is in European laws or it's uh, implied in many of the laws, including Thailand as well, where there is a need for some kind of responsibility. So I've taken a quotation from the GDPR in the second bullet point here, talking about how the controller or the school shall be responsible for and be able to demonstrate compliance. And that's really what accountability is, that, that there is a responsibility and a need to demonstrate it. And in and this is why it, uh, laws such as the PDPA will have have um, fines, enforcement action, and even right up to criminal sanctions taking place for non-compliance with the law, because there is an expectation that people are accountable, that they're responsible, that they should be doing what they're doing, and to be able to demonstrate their compliance as well. So just the back end of that quotation on the second body point, be able to demonstrate compliance is really important. So that's what we mean by accountability. Never think of it just in terms of, oh, I'm doing what I need to do. It's also I need to demonstrate what I'm what I'm supposed to be doing as well. Just, so. just one point there, Andrew. I just think that um, yep. I'd like to apologise to everyone because the the upload of the slides into LiveStorm seemed to have messed with the um, the overall formatting. So um, the actual formatted slide deck will be coming out um, uh, in within the follow up email. Yes, thanks for that, Mark. Yeah, I 
noticed we've got our last bullet point here some some errors on that first line but but just in terms of what accountability does as apart from just meeting your legal obligations actually by taking an accountability based principle that is to say that as leaders as data protection um, officers as senior management or whatever your role is by taking this this responsibility on head on and and choosing to to make it the focus the focal point of of why you're doing things you actually end up with all of those items at the, at the bottom of this slide you build trust especially with parents students and staff. So the people you work with and the people you work for and the people with whom you have contracts, um, if you can demonstrate that you're you're taking care to use their personal data appropriately, that you're you're going to uh, be responsible in how you manage it, that you understand that it's their data, that it belongs to them, and you have rights to make use of it only because uh, only <clears throat> because it helps them ultimately, um, and is part of your real relationship that can really help you build trust and second line down says demonstrating ethical values so here we emphasize that it, you don't want to do things just because the law requires you to do it nor do you do things just because a regulator gives best guidance you actually want to do it because it's as good it is good ethical uh, there are good ethical reasons to do so so go so it would be the wrong approach if you took data protection law and said, right, what are the what are the minimum things here that we need to do? What do we need what do we need to to tick off in order to ensure that that we're doing what we should be doing? Actually, it's better to think in broader categories of what's uh, basically right and wrong. So ethical values are really important in data protection. Um, for some things, it's fairly benign. Name and email address, you get marketing emails are really annoying. But other times it starts getting really serious when we start talking about um, uh, biometric data, fingerprint data, facial scans, things like this. These are these are uh, aspects of people's personal data that if they're lost into the world, they're, they're lost forever. You only have one set of fingerprint scans. And if those are available on the dark web for people to use, um, then it's very difficult to, to restore that back to where it was. And then there's all the complications that arise from losing financial data, um, losing passport data and so forth. So your school should take a responsible approach that demonstrates really strong ethical values in how it handles people's personal data. Excuse me a second. And then the next one down, which I'm going to focus on on the subsequent slide, is enhancing brand by showing responsibility. In fact, I don't, I didn't want to put this first, but it is a matter of fact that that from from the perspective of um, uh, showing why your school is a good place for ch uh, parents to send their children, it can it can help you if you've got a data protection program in place that shows that you are responsible, not in just uh, not only in terms of how you take the children's data but also how you handle uh, staff data parents data and everyone else's it can really show value that your school is thinking in terms not just in, in its raw education or even in the way it raises its finances but actually even into things to do with personal uh, private lives as well and the last thing that accountability can help with is mitigating enforcement action and i put this at the bottom because i don't think it's it's a good idea usually to say that you want to avoid fines and penalties. Of course, you do want to avoid being fined by a regulator. And in the Thai law, there are actually prison sentences as part of the um, uh, as part of the range of punishments that um, can be applied for non-compliance. These should not be your primary reasons to do anything. But uh, it is a matter of fact that good accountability will help with mitigating that, reducing the likelihood that there'll be any enforcement action. So those are the ideas that we have in terms of why this is important. Um, and let's look now at the next slide um, in terms of um, the, the brand value that I mentioned earlier. This is a quotation from Elizabeth Denham. She's actually the head of the UK regulator for data protection. And it's a really interesting point that she raises um, based on her long experience in, in, in data protection and working with many uh, organizations and uh, companies across the UK. She mentions this, accountability encourages an upfront investment in privacy fundamentals, but it offers a payoff down the line, not just in better legal compliance, but a competitive edge. We believe there is a real opportunity for organizations to present themselves on the basis of how they respect the privacy of individuals 
And over time, this can play more of a role in consumer choice. So she's using terms like competitive edge, payoff down the line, a role in consumer choice. And indeed, we're seeing this now. Big tech companies like Apple are starting to see the value of this. And actually, I've seen an advert where they, they talk about how privacy is absolutely central to their operations now. And let's be frank, these large companies are doing this because it will help them generate more revenue. It will help them uh, meet consumer needs because there are increasingly demands in society for people to have their personal data protected and for large tech companies to look after it more appropriately. So this is something that's that's emerging. Um, you wouldn't have conversations like this five years ago, 10 years ago. It's just emerging more and more. And I think the trajectory is that organizations need to show themselves as being responsible parties when it comes to um, people's privacy. Now, in terms of practicalities of what we're going to do, I just want to have a slide here talking about the framework. I did begin this uh, session by, by noting the discussion of the nine framework. We're going to give you all a copy of the nine framework in case you don't have it. It is a free download and we're gonna provide you with a video to help you understand it. The reason why we created a framework is because various people, including the regulators listed on this page, have identified the importance of a framework. So what is a framework, first of all? Let me just define that. A framework is a predefined set of principles, concepts, ideas, or common action items that you should follow in order to help you meet your compliance needs. That's what a framework is. There are lots of frameworks around the world. Other organizations have created them. Um, certain regulators have created a framework as well. They all function in much the same way. They identify the main things you should have in a compliance program. They give you pointers as to what you should have in place. And the idea is you would you would look at those, uh, see how it meets the, uh, see how it can be adapted into your organization. And then you'll start uh, building your compliance program around it. So a framework is, is the built, you know, the, the underlying structure, the infrastructure around which you build your program. So we created our own framework. It came out just last month, the beginning of uh, February. We'd spent months working on this. Uh, we had looked at data protection laws around the world. We looked at regulated guidance. We had uh, used the collective many years experience that we'd built up. And in fact, the framework itself had derived from um, a toolkit that Nine had developed years ago. So it's actually technically been years in the making as we've developed and improved it. In addition to that, the Nine Data Privacy Framework is the only framework that is built, built specifically with schools in mind. So you don't have to use it. Um, but uh, and, but use something, use a framework of any sort. But as I said, ours is the one that all of our consultancy is built around, our tool is built around it, and it's the only one that's built with schools in mind. Now, onto this slide, let's look at some of the things that various data protection regulators have said, or in one or two cases, actual groups of regulators. The UK regulator said, if you implement a privacy management framework, this can help you embed your accountability measures and create a culture of privacy across your organization. So they are strong believers in this. Uh, take one, take any one, make sure it's a recognized one, um, and this can help you uh, develop that culture of privacy. Over in Ireland, they have identified universal elements of accountability. When they talked about universal elements here, they were talking about global data protection laws. What is it that uh, around the world people are looking for in terms of accountability? And they identify these, leadership and oversight from senior management, risk assessment, privacy by design, transparency and openness of privacy policies, and maintaining internal records of processing. The one I'll just mention there is the very beginning of that. They talk about leadership and oversight of some senior management. That appears at the top of their uh, of their document that describes this. And I'll talk a bit more about leadership and oversight in a moment, but that's core, essential to getting your program in place. In South America, the Chilean regulators said that organizations can only achieve data protection under a regulatory framework that provides for an adequate data security ecosystem. So they're quite emphatic. You can only achieve this protection if you have some kind of framework that's based around uh, statute regulatory laws, expectations and needs. Um, only then can you build an ecosystem that works together. I like the word ecosystem on the Chilean regulator's comment because it, things interplay, they lock together um, and they depend on each other as well. That's how your, that's how your data protection program functions. In uh, Asia, Singapore, the, the regulator, the PDPC, has also recommended that organizations adopt a framework to demonstrate accountability. There they were talking particularly about how you demonstrate it. It's again, part of the 
part of the you know there's a two throng part of accountability on the one hand there's doing what you're supposed to do and then you need to demonstrate it as well and they're arguing that this whole idea of demonstrating and putting into practice needs to be framework based and then lastly the global privacy assembly which is actually um, an established group of international regulators data protection regulators around the world came together recently they were actually talking specifically about artificial intelligence but actually it's quite interesting that in their report on that they did say in order to be effective accountability obligations should be assessed against clearly defined principles and frameworks so same kind of principles whether you're talking particularly about artificial intelligence and data protection or about data protection generally having some kind of framework can help so that's why we're that's one of the things we're going to provide for you today the nine data privacy framework and I'm going to start looking at it in a bit more detail. So I'll go to the next slide. This is an overview of the nine data privacy framework. There are nine specific categories. So if you're familiar with this already, then bear with me. This will be a refresher for you. Uh, we, we collect together all of the things that we believe are commonly found in data protection programs around the world, particularly when it comes to schools. And we identified in the end 64 specific activities, 64 common activities um, that are useful for schools. And we were able to spread them across nine categories. So here they are on the screen, uh, leadership and governance, record of processing and data mapping, incident and breach management, information rights and data ethics, training and awareness, data sharing and contracts, information security operations, risk management and controls, policies and notices. So that's how we've broken it down. Um, you'll find other frameworks do something broadly similar. They might have more than nine categories. They might have fewer, but everyone does the same thing. They're looking at what holistically um, a typical organization should have in place to meet its data protection obligations. And these, this is our grouping. Um, some of these necessarily overlap. I mentioned before it was an ecosystem of things uh, gathered together. Um, but the one that I want to home in on is the leadership and governance there in the top left-hand corner, because that's really about accountability. And... Uh, most, if not all of you on this call are going to be data protection leaders or, or uh, maybe senior managers or part of the leadership and governance part of your school. So this is ready for you. How do we actually go about doing things? Um, let's take a bit more of a closer look at this. As I mentioned before, there's 64 activities across these nine categories. We're just going to look at the, the eight that come under leadership and governance. So this is the first category in our framework, leadership and governance, and these are the first four bullet points. So let's talk about what it says. This is directly from the framework that we're gonna provide you. The first one says, establish clear lines of accountability and oversight for data protection compliance at the highest level of leadership. So here we are looking that uh, accountability is something that comes from the very highest levels. It's top down. It begins um, with the most senior levels of management. It's no good trying to run data protection programs from middle management. It never works like that. And unless you get the senior management buy-in, um, you don't get the kind of necessary engagement or um, you don't foster the culture. You don't get the resourcing. You don't get the 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 input and you certainly don't get the oversight that you need so the first line here is really important we put it in number one at the very top of our framework because you have to get that management buy-in at the very highest level the next one down is to do with the demonstrating part that i've been emphasizing throughout this the practical um, uh, consequence what it looks like here you need to demonstrate evidence-based compliance with data privacy requirements it's never sufficient to say you've done it uh, most data protection laws, including PDPA, require um, documented records. They require some kind of formal evidence um, that you're actually doing the things you're supposed to be doing. And that may take the may take various forms, policies, contracts, records, other formal documentation, etc. The next one down is ensuring that is embedding data protection awareness and responsibility into the strategic and operational planning of the organization. So there are two parts to this. Strategic planning is about looking far ahead. Operational planning is about looking at day-to-day -day things. So whatever you're planning, uh, whether it's in the short term, the midterm or the future, uh, long term, uh, you need to have data protection awareness and responsibility in there as the central part of it. Uh, it doesn't work if you have data protection as a sideshow. Um, it needs to be right there as part of how the organization decides um, on how it's going to run its operations now and in the future. Now, lest we believe that 
everything um, requires full-scale data protection, review and assessments, and so forth. In fact, that's not the case. But data protection laws in the fourth bullet point down are always risk-based. This includes PDPA. So this means that you focus your energies on the highest risk aspects. In a school, that means things like safeguarding data, welfare data, health data, it, or or biometric data if you're using it. If you're doing anything to do with criminal records in Thailand, that's considered sensitive data. So employee background checks, for example, that's where you focus your energies on. Um, and so this is what we mean by risk-based. It needs to be proportionate. There's no expectation that you need to um, go through every single aspect in exactly the same level of detail. You look at what's um, required. You look at what the risk tolerance is of your organization. You, you, you understand what the law requires you to do, um, and you take a risk-based approach. So that's what you need to do. And this is where our consultancy spends a lot of time help working with schools. Um, I, a good deal of my time is spent helping organizations understand where they need to start and what they need to focus on and how much what what is a proportionate pro, a proposed approach to compliance where can we be a bit more high level and where do we need to focus our energies so this is a key aspect um, of leadership and governance and also therefore demonstrating accountability right so those are the first four bullet points on leadership and governance i'm going to go to the next slide and give you four more bullet points um to finish off um the the category we have on on that part of our framework First bullet point on here, designated data protection officer or equivalent with direct reporting lines to senior management. So there is a requirement under the PDPA to, to have a data protection officer um, where there is uh, significant personal data processing taking place. Um, for some organizations, this won't apply. Um, if you don't need a data protection officer, you really should have something equivalent in place. And again, I'd go back to what I said earlier about um, really good accountability is not just looking at the letter of the law. You should look at it from an ethical perspective. You should look at it from also from um, the perspective of what's, what's the right thing to do. Um, having some kind of person responsible for data protection is important. Whether you're going to designate it formally as a data protection officer um, or whether you're going to apply it to a team of people, a group of individuals who work together, their function, their, their consequences of their action should be the same. This is about providing advice, support. It should be about monitoring compliance. It should be about ensuring that um, training and policies are in place. It should be ensuring that procedures are followed. It should be being the contact point for anyone in the school doing data protection to ask for help or advice. It should be the place where, where parents and children and other people can have a, a, a recognized person they can talk, they can ask questions to. So the data protection officer plays a very important role in being the, 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 um, being the central point of contact for all these individuals and for ensuring that the school's uh, program is in place. Notice the wording we have here, direct reporting lines to senior management that is established in many countries now around the world in statute. So it's not just best practice, um, it's become a legal requirement that actually they have reporting lines directly to the highest levels. That is to ensure accountability is in place. Next one's down, managing roles and responsibilities as appropriate across the organization. So this is talking specifically about uh, roles and responsibilities relevant to data protection. It will not work in any school unless except for the very very smallest ones to have as uh, just one or two people involved in data protection you need to have people across your organization there's no way that a data protection officer or equivalent is going to understand what's going on across all the different functions and departments so you must have people across the organization who have a sufficient level of training and understanding and time and resource to take part in uh, the in the compliance needs of the school Next one down, implement a comprehensive system or software to manage the organization's compliance program. Now, a comprehensive system can be uh, a, a toolkit of spreadsheets, software can be things like the Nine app. It's anything you have that enables you to manage your program. It will not do to just try and do it all via email or something like that. You've got to have some kind of structured system where you can organize things and, and ensure that you know where you can find things. Um, partly you will have requirements to notify regulators or data subjects of data breaches and, and provide information about um, why you're using people's data and give them access to it. So there are lots of things that come together that mean that you should have some kind of organized system in place. 
And the last one I'm just going to dwell on for a couple of slides now. There is a need for every organization to maintain proactive oversight of changes to relevant privacy laws, regulated guidance, and best practice. There is so much going on around the world in privacy laws. It's not just the PDPA in Thailand that you need to figure out. This is because many privacy laws have what we call extraterritorial effect. What that means is that you can be in one country, um, but the laws of another country will still apply. Um, what that means in practice is this: if you were, if you were, uh, if you had a an employee or a former student um, who's now living in Europe, and they contact you and say, "Please tell me what data you have of me," the fact that they're in Europe means that uh, you still need you, uh, you need to abide by European data protection laws in providing access to their data. And the reverse is true. Thailand's PDPA also also has extraterritorial effect. So it means that if, a, if an organization in Europe is processing the data of people who live in Thailand, they are respond. They need to they need to um, uh, ensure they meet the requirements of PDPA. So lots of privacy laws are like that. There are now over 600 privacy laws around the world that are specifically relevant um, to schools. So these are the things that you need to keep in mind and they change all the time. There's also regulated guidance and best practice. Let me just flip quickly through the next couple of slides. Um, on the point of relevant privacy laws, we have, these are privacy laws effective since October 2020 alone. Um, laws are coming out all the time and here they are for um, we see Thailand on the second bullet point is going to be effective um, from from the end of May but we've got Turkey Panama coming in soon as well um, Singapore have updated their regulations um, just last month um, there are specific laws related to health and other things here going on in places like Canada and elsewhere as well so lots of laws going on that you need to keep up to date with um, we do this for our clients all the time we I, we spend a lot of time in our compliance team figuring out what's going on understanding what's relevant seeing what applies to schools um, and these are just the laws if i go to the next page this is where again a lot of our work involves um, looking at what regulators come out with so data protection <coughs> excuse me a second data protection regulators around the world uh, provide guidance all the time this is what we've got so far this month um, uh, just in March from various countries around the world, um, regulators giving guidance on data subject rights or testing obligations for COVID or how to handle sensitive data or biometrics or uh, data breach notification or email or how you deal with third parties, etc. All of these things are on here. Um, so again, we spend a lot of time um, understanding this, helping to shape our policies and procedures, helping to shape any guidance we give to our clients, making sure we can answer any questions with up-to-date information. So this is all part of a good compliance program. If you work closely with us, then we can help you provide this information. Uh, we have access to lots of really good resources that helps us to understand this. And we've got a very strong compliance team where we spend uh, a great deal of time doing research and, um, and drafting documentation. So that's part of what we do. I um, uh, hope that's clear enough. Do I haven't noticed any questions so far, but um, we're pretty much at the end of this. So um, we'll take any now, I suppose, and then we can go on to the Q&A. Yeah, we've had it. We've had a, a couple of questions, um, Andrew. So I'll do, I'll do a couple, then we'll, then we'll do the Q&A with, with, with Vaughan, um, and then we can ask it any, any more. There's one question that I think I've already answered. It's, it's, is the controller the same as the DPO? Uh, it's not the same. Uh, no, the controller is the school in your case. The controller is um, whoever makes the decisions on what's going on. Um, so wherever you see the word controller, you can substitute that with the word school. The DPO primarily has an advisory function. The DPO is a person um, yeah. as opposed to an organization. And the DPO really has a, a, a role in doing, providing guidance, um, providing support. It's principally an advisory role. It's an oversight role. It's about monitoring compliance. Um, and it's about providing being a focal point. So yeah, they're two different things. And just, just on another point on, on the DPO, you know, our so our message is being that you, know, you shouldn't just you know whilst the DPO is important, it's about building a team and building capability and capacity specifically within international education because you have the transient nature of staff. So rather than having all your sort of eggs in, in one basket with one person, it's building a team because that team can also make objective decisions around the processing of personal data in the school. Um, got it. Got a got a message. A question here from John. Um, 
uh, for you, Andrew. So if um, if students from Thailand are applying to universities outside th Thailand, is it the responsibility of the data processor to ensure that it complies with the PDPA? Or should the Thai school carry out its due diligence to ensure the data processor does comply? If it misuses Thai data, <clears throat> who is responsible? All right, um, let's just define some terms here. So data processor, it uh, uh, would be the, uh, would be essentially a contractor or some third party that processes data or does things under instruction from someone else. They don't make decisions on how data is being handled. So they're, so they're distinct from a controller. So we're two things, controller and a processor. I talked about controller a moment ago. The controller is an organization that decides what's happening with personal data. Um, a processor is one that carries out instructions on their behalf. Now, in this case, we're talking about students from Thailand applying to universities outside Thailand. In fact, those universities outside Thailand will be controllers. They wouldn't be data processors. So what we have here is that the universities outside Thailand have their own responsibilities and obligations to ensure that data is being processed properly. Um, so when your students are applying to those, it's the responsibility of those universities to make sure that they're doing it properly. Um, they will make the decisions on how the, the data is being processed and, and it's, it's theirs to deal with. Um, so you wouldn't be responsible if those universities misused it um, and you're not under obligation to do any kind of due diligence on them because they're not processors. Perfect. Um, so we're just going to move on to uh, to Vaughan and then feel free to keep on adding in your questions into the, um, into the chat in all the questions box. Um, so, um, so Vaughan, thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, thanks and, for having me. Uh, It'd be great if, if you just give everyone who's joined the webinar just an overview of, sort of who you are and your, your role at, at NIST. Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Vaughn Pope. I've been at NIST for two years now. I've been a past director of IT at a number of schools, and I'm taking a little bit of a different role this year. So I was appointed to data protection officer last year when the, when the PDPA was going to go into effect in May of last year. So we did start preparing for this roughly February last year, and we've been working on it since. Um, that's that's pretty much me. Um, I will be very, very honest. It has taken us 12 months to get this to get this properly on the road or in a in a way where we feel comfortable, where we've reached compliance and where we're comfortable with the evidence we have towards reaching compliance. Great. So it has been a fair process. So yeah, you've been you've been working with Nine um, for like well yeah. over a year. Yeah, we were out with you guys last February. Uh -huh. um, what would you say have been the greatest challenges um, at NIST for your privacy program? Um, greatest challenges really came came down to time and making sure we got started fast enough and got started effectively enough. Um, the data mapping is really where it all starts, and just like uh, just like it was mentioned earlier you can't do this without community consensus so you really do need your help or your aid from your functional area leads so your heads of departments your other functional area leads they will they will all inform that process and as long as you get started on that data mapping that will inform every other process that comes after that so yeah that was uh, i think the biggest issue was, for us was just getting time in order to complete all the information that we needed to get. Cool. Now, what would you say are the three lessons you've learned that other schools <laughs> could apply in their program? <laughs> Given that many, wow. many people are just starting off the <laughs> journey. Um, first and foremost, if if we're starting if we're starting now, then I apologize to to all of you because it's going to be a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, time, time, and more time. You've got to you've got to lay that out. You've got to include your your governance, your senior leadership. They you've got to include the community, and definitely without without fail, get working on the narratives for your data mapping. So at least find out what the general process is, where it's coming from, and that's really where your community consensus is going to come, uh, play in big. They know their departments. They know their areas really well just have a quick conversation with them, sit them down, get that information in, and then you can break it down as per what you need. What are the legal requirements? What is, what is the information you're gathering? 
but yeah, get going on that. Um, very, very quickly after, you'll start to need your policies. You'll start to need your privacy policies for your front-facing website. You'll start to need your policy documents that will inform how you as a school or how you want to set up your culture for data pr protection. You, like, like you rightfully said, you want to make sure data protection is integrated and as it's a part of the culture versus just being an add-on. It, it shouldn't be just an add-on. It should be something you your teachers believe in, your teams believe in, and your community believes in. Yeah. So, so if I'm correct in understanding, so you guys focus on building your through your data map and you built your record uh -huh. processing, and then you've used that information yeah. to build your policies, processes, and procedures that actually reflect what you do. Yeah. Our our data mapping brought out everything. It 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 showed us our gaps. It showed us where we were lacking. It showed us where we could have some risks and our in in possible breaches. And so that informed every other step. So we were able to move faster after we got that initial yeah. uh, process of data mapping done. But the data mapping, then the visual audit, and then the review, is is a is a good chunk of time by itself. Uh, yeah. How how long did you do you think it took you to sort of get that data mapping completed? <laughs> Uh, to be fair, we we were hit with COVID immediately <laughs> after we started this process. So it, it did it did uh, it did sideswipe our process a little bit. But um, I'd say to to ensure you're going through the entire process, you get to do your visual audit and you do the review. Yeah, I would yeah. say three months is a comfortable period of time to ensure that everything is correct. Yeah, fine. Okay, brilliant. And just uh, there's a question. I can't remember who it's from because I'm not looking at the questions. Uh -huh. But they asked me about um, the record of processing, um, and the app has a quick start wizard that allows yeah. you to build your record of processing based upon you know, the, the common processing activities of a school. Yeah. So we would we would say that would save you 300 hours of time just using that wizard. You no, know, just sort of Absolutely. understanding it. By, yeah, by, by um, yeah, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have been able to get off the ground as fast as we did if we didn't have all the templated documents and pol policy documents that uh, you provided us with. There was a fair amount of information in the nine framework that really gives you a head start. We wouldn't have had this start if we didn't have that. It was it was a little bit rough to to begin with. Cool. What, what what do you see as the um the biggest challenge? So what do you see the biggest challenges for international schools in maintaining their compliance programs? I believe, honestly, some of the some of the biggest challenges you're fa you're going to face is uh, the upkeep in training, and the insurance that you have a senior leadership constantly being a part of the process and having that responsibility as well. Uh, beyond that, it's it's really just time for the DPO. In a lot of cases, I believe most schools won't have a dedicated DPO and it is a time intensive process. It is going to take some time to get all this in, in, in order and in place and to continue that process and to continue that culture key, uh, onwards training also so time is going to be your really limiting factor here yeah we had a question here actually from uh, this is it department um mm -hmm. is, uh, and Andrew, you can also jump in here yeah. is, is it dpo a full-time position and <laughs> who would normally undertake this role it's not a it's not required as full-time position, so it can be part-time yeah. um i mean very large organizations typically will have it as a full-time oh. position so it needs to be you need to determine for your school it's part of again it's one of those things where every organization uh -huh. needs to decide what's proportionate uh take a risk-based approach and uh, identify what's what's right some of the schools we support have decided on a full-time position others decided on part-time uh -huh. so it really depends on the situation but there's no requirement for it to be full-time uh -huh. it just needs to fulfill the needs necessary for the school uh, the second part of that question who would normally undertake this role it, uh, so well a few things to say the DPO needs to be someone with expert understanding of the law they need to uh, they need to understand the compliance requirements they need to be adequately resourced all that kind of thing there are a few things we can say that it shouldn't be now if you were in Europe it, uh, there's actually it's actually stated that a DPO cannot for example be um, simultaneously in a position where there's any kind of conflict of interest um they cannot be uh, responsible for hr for example or marketing mm. and be the dpo at the same time because yeah. it will be seen as a potential conflict that now that's on, not, on andrew is that yeah. is that just conflict of interest 
across the entire organization or the conflict of interest just in their department because it was my understanding that they, they could take on that role of leading data protection but they just can't audit themselves they correct yeah. it's really yeah it's just again it's not it, it's it's not it's not it's one of those things where everyone needs to interpret for themselves what's appropriate um those are guidance notes from what should or shouldn't take place and also i should say that that was coming from european guidance uh, we've not seen that in other countries um such as thailand for example um so people who normally undertake the role is it's 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 common for people who work in the it areas to do so uh -huh. it's common for people working in admissions to do so yep. we've seen that as well um but those are the kinds of areas that that normally take that um, it definitely it definitely works very closely with IT. So if you do have a good relationship with your IT department, that definitely helps. And cybersecurity comes very very close, I think, in connection with the with data protection of what we understood of it. So that it does definitely help to have a good connection with your IT department. Yeah, you inevitably have to understand IT things <laughs> Some, uh -huh. uh, as part of DPS. So that helps. It, it's sort of many schools where where where. When, where, where are our schools? Because quite a few of our clients have their directors of IT or tech directors as, as a DPO. In those cases, most of those schools then work with us for us for nine to do an annual audit on their IT systems and services. That then pro pro provides objectivity and audit in those areas to mitigate the risk of a conflict of interest. So where there is a conflict, what the data protection law says is that you need to understand what the conflict of interests are and manage the risks associated with that conflict of interest. Because in many schools, there is no other person who can possibly do it apart from the, the IT director. And there are you, know, you, you do come across a rhetoric that that is um, non-compliant. And remember, um, uh, data protection law is a risk-based law, so nothing is non-compliant. It's all about what are your risks of processing? What are the risks of your conflict of interest? And you managing those risks. I've got another question here for both of you. Um, so, um, and then we'll come on, we'll come back to some of the questions, all questions I've got for yep. you. So it, it makes sense, so this is from Stanislav, it makes sense that the DPO must have, have the qualification for performing that role, and you mentioned this, Andrew. Mm. Yet, do you have information where the organization can assign initially a, D, a DPO that does not have a qualification, yet is undertaking a course with a certificate? Because many people, I'm guaranteeing like 90% of the people who are on these webinars will not have any qualifications within, within yeah within data right, yeah. so how do you how do you interpret that how do you overcome okay. that? that it is not the case that the dpo must have a qualification um so it is uh so there's no requirement for a formal qualification <clears throat> it is however uh recognized in order to do the dpo role they must have knowledge they must have understanding they must uh -huh. understand what's going on they must have training so whether you have an actual qualification or not is not the important thing they just must have the the, the requisite knowledge to, to do their task so in in terms of Stanislav's question, I mean, yeah, I mean, undertaking a course with a certificate, certainly valuable, but it's really not about the qualification, it's about where they've got the skills. So making sure the DPOs are adequately equipped, making sure they're adequately resourced. Um, the PDP actually has a requirement that they are adequately resourced. So, so yeah, putting those into place can be the case. And I see Stanislav's got another question as well about, we have a lecturer teaching ethics for IT professionals. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be absolutely can be someone mm -hmm. like this, provided that they have the relevant, they've got the requisite training tools, resources, okay. make sure they've got mm -hmm. what they need. Um, and by the way, we I provide a lot, I spend a lot of my time doing training. Um, so training for schools, that's what we do as well. We don't issue certificates or qualifications, but we do provide uh, ongoing training for, for some of our clients so we can help with that too. Yeah. The um, Vaughan, did you have anything, anything to add with that? With that, those points? No, that was it. Um, well, the certifications haven't yet fully come into effect over here either. They there are some uh, there are some companies offering some courses, but really it's just it, you're not coming up with the standards or anything by yourself. You're not coming up with the laws by yourself. You're uh, you're enforcing what already exists on a framework, and you're ensuring that that project is being completed. So as long as you have some skills in project management and you're willing to learn, you're willing to understand what you need to do. Yeah, that's you're you're following a process. You're ensuring that it it is occurring. What what you also find is that the, the training courses on in Thailand on the PDPA, um, much like they're, they're the mm. same everywhere else in terms of the specific laws of the in country, they'll just they'll just they'll just regurgitate what is you know, what the yeah. PDPA says by the, each of the articles. 
it doesn't give you the interpretation of of how that applies to your organization because you can only do that once you understand how the data and information how what you collect and how that's processed within your organization then you're evaluating the risks so, so any external data protection officer unless they're sat within your school is not necessarily going to be able to provide limited it will be able to provide limited support to you unless they understand the workings of a school so what data protection law often says that you have to understand the ins and outs of the industry that you're working within you sort of really just sits within the data and the information within your organization to understand how you process it to then understand your risks um and so it's more about you know i think what what you just said there vaughn in terms of you you know if you if you've got a good approach to be you know in terms of business analysis to project mm -hmm. management you can understand the fundamentals of data protection law and then apply right. the principles of the pdpa to to actually your context within your specific yeah. school exactly yeah. okay um next question so um we've got, we've got so, one from kevin lewis here on this chat screen mark um okay sure. kevin asks apologies has already been answered I, i'm not sure it has been but what would no. a dpia <laughs> assessment look like when considering data shared with large LMS, DMS companies, such as CDs or school-based. So DPIAs essentially look the same, whatever you're doing. Um, let me just define what they are. So a DPIA is a data protection impact assessment. So think of it really as a risk assessment. Um, it's where you look at a thing, a, it might be a system like school-based, it might be a process, it might be anything that you're doing, and you identify what are the risks here? Um, what, what kind of data are we doing? What are we doing with this data? What's our purpose behind it? Um, where might we be causing um, uh, causing dangers to appear um, in the handling of people's data, and then what are we going to do about it? What or how are we going to? What, what are the risks? So all kinds of things you would consider for to, uh, for uh, large LMS DMS companies. You'll think about security. Um, there'll be data that you're sending to these other systems. It's probably cloud based. They probably have servers mm -hmm. elsewhere um, you want to make sure that you're that they have adequate security in place you want to think about how is data being encrypted on transfer things like that you'd need to think about who has access to it um, uh, particularly from uh, your own side so who are your administrators who who might be able to delete data or, or something like that um, you'd consider such things as the contract you have in place with these people is it an ongoing contract does it cover data protection requirements um, you'd need to think about how long you're going to keep the data for what kind of what kind of records retention management have you got are you um, uh, you, you can't keep data forever in most cases, so you need to think about how long you can keep it, what are your reasons for getting rid of it. Um, is there any data in there that's really sensitive or high risk, or if it was disclosed would cause embarrassment or harm to anybody? If so, how is that protected? What are your what are your means of ensuring that, um, that, uh, that you have controls in place to mitigate against that? So all of these are things that will take place. When it comes to DPIAs, we have a standard set of questions. So we have a DPIA template that you can apply. And again, it's one of the things that we do. I help with schools a lot, um, but it, you know, that that will be a functionality in the app as well. We currently have a version in a, in a toolkit as well. So, so that's what you do with the DPIA. Look look at it from a standard set of questions um, and understand the security, the risks, and what you're doing about it. And, and, um, and with that, Andrew, you do the you need to build your record of processing first. So yes, you need your record processing first, and then you do your DPIAs. So let's say you know, if you're starting your program now in four in three to four months' time, you'll be doing the DPIAs. Is the first point now if you are then looking to put in a new system like you're putting in the seesaw you don't already have it you then do the dpia at the very beginning to work out actually whether that that, that organization sits with you and your appetite for risk and then you would then you'd link it back to your record of processing right yes absolutely it's always i mean it's not a, it it but it's just really good practice to start with the records processing before you do the DPIAs. Mm -hmm. um, the record process understands, you know, what data is being processed, how who has access to it, how long you're keeping it, all the essentials, and then from that you can start thinking about the risk and thinking about what you're going to do about the risk and, and and so forth. And if I'm not mistaken, a lot of companies have already completed DPIAs for schools. So if you request for a DPIA from a company or you're doing an assessment there's a likely chance they've already gone through the process and so they already have that information available or ready to you. If, if, you're going, if you are with Nine, then Nine has a fair amount of LMS systems and common school systems 
CISOL, school base, Veracross, Manageback, and the rest of them, that, it, with, that most schools have already uh, joined in to do DPIAs on already. All right, I think so, we may be confusing yeah. two things here. So there's a difference between a data, a data processor assessment, which is a DPA, data processor assessment, and a data processing mm -hmm. impact assessment. So, so a data process assessment, you're right. We have loads of those done already. Template yeah. examples, we're doing them all the time. We're doing a flow of them right now where we look at external vendors and we're really looking at the arrangement between schools and the, and the, the, the contracts that are in place, the privacy policies. So absolutely those are in place where we look at vendors and we see, um, you know, how do they process data and what do we need to be aware of? So yeah, those templates and those, those mm -hmm. actually are different from a DPIA, right? So data protection right. impact assessment is a risk assessment that would incorporate what I've just mentioned, but it okay. goes further. It looks about how your uniquely your own school is handling those. So um, yeah, so we don't do templates for those, um, but uh, but you know, the, the, the templates we do have will certainly be helpful in, in putting together DPIA. Great. The, so, so Vaughan, would you mind, um, you've got your, your LMS that, about that, 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 that NIST to put together in terms of demonstrating yeah. how you are supporting the rest of the community. So if you uh -huh. wouldn't mind sharing your screen, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just two seconds. So apologies, we're going to have a little bit of a inception. Okay, here we go. So what we did was we actually, within, within our Google suite, we created our information site and another LMS site on our, within our own system, within our own servers. So our teams can always jump back and get information whenever they need it. As you can see, there's a little deadline introduction and data protection training. Um, Andrew and Mark, I'm guessing you'll, you'll find this really familiar, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so this is our, basically our, our own internal site where you can always go back and always look for the information, pass the presentations, pass the, pass the normal, the normal standard. So this is one of our points of compliance. The next one is, uh, an LMS system that we just set up through WordPress. It was relatively straightforward and relatively resource, uh, light so to speak. And as we, as we have it on, on the front end facing Google site, we have an LMS course just quickly built into our own system data protection. And in doing so, we are then able to track and have, a, a, a an entire, like uh, an entire system built up just for it. So as you can see, we have cybersecurity and data protection. Um, both are very important to this entire concept of safeguarding. And I believe uh, data protection is it does come under the umbrella of safeguarding because safeguarding as a whole. Mm -hmm. So this helps us with, uh, with evidence for our compliance because all our teachers, all our team, all our teams now have certificates that are pre-built out of these courses. And it's nothing more than a 10 or a 15 minute course. I can just show you a quick look at what it is. Obviously, we do have a Bitly site for our Google site. Um, it does not show me, I'm sorry, it doesn't show me the uh, full curriculum. I'll stop that for now. But that's pretty much what we have, what we have uh, gotten off the ground to have the evidence piece in hand. So we will sync this back with our SIS system so that the records of all this completion and the records of the course for cybersecurity and for data protection are also held in our student information system. So the teachers will always have a record of things that they've completed. And, and, that, and that's, something that, that's something that essentially we provide a lot of the resources and the training, but you guys have just created, okay. that, created that yourself really yeah. straightforward. You don't need any external consultants to do that. Your just internal no. teams have, have created those, those sites. Yeah, right? it was. And it's it's information that has been that's been built up basically being being uh, wor having worked on this process for years. So that's information that's common that's in the common that's in the the yeah in public space that we can get. There are translations for the PDPA over here, so you can take whatever take the information you need and then put it in a nice, easy to access location for your teams. Yeah, and I, I, and I think that's a great way to demonstrate accountability in terms of the mm -hmm. training of your staff. Um, okay. know that you're sort of measuring through your SIS who is completing it 
um, yep. that you're keeping it up to date. You know, that is a prime, a, a great example of accountability. Yeah, and we're hoping that it it uh, takes the next step with us because in in the case where you know the right to access or the right to portability or any of those rights, it might make that one step just a little bit easier where everyone has all that information at their fingertips and so they won't necessarily need to make specific requests for it they'll be able to do it themselves correct so this is my final question for you and if, if anyone asks mm -hmm. if anyone, anyone, anyone has any other questions and please pop them into the mm -hmm. the questions now because after this question if we do not have anything else and we'll sort of wrap up so you've all you know in terms of 12 months of um of doing this program what advice would you give to someone in you know, sort of your shoes for 12 months on um again if if this is if this is the starting point i'm sorry um data mapping data mapping data mapping that that's where you gotta go that's gonna give you your policies that's gonna give you and your gaps are it's gonna give you every next step get your policies done talk to your teams um definitely inform the teams you'll find a lot of people uh, really do are very interested in, in in data protection and it definitely helps to talk to the teams in terms of the individual rather than the institution everyone uptakes information far better if there's an if there's an individual connection and yeah we are we are all data subjects at the end of the day so a right a right to know and a right to have that information uh, makes sense to all of us and yeah there's no one size that fits all there are things that are going to throw speed breakers at you and you're going to wonder if this actually does fit your organization and i think i love that comment from andrew it's it's really what your organization is comfortable with don't don't do it just because you are checking a box do it because it makes sense for your organization i i will throw a little spanner into the works the one thing, the one difficulty I think most people are going to face is that photo and image policy. And that is going to be a little bit of a, of a trying time to make sure that policy comes into effect, it works well, and that you have a system that, that can tie in well with that policy. That's one we've definitely hit hard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vaughn. So um, there was well, one last um, question that I'll just touch upon from Peter, yeah. and he said, any words of wisdom as to the the suitability or unsuitability of various brands of small information systems? And I think I think I'll just, I'll just touch upon this is from my experience with with SIS platforms, it's around understanding the security protections that they apply to the data that you're giving to them. So so you need to challenge them in terms of how they structure their software development, how they test their code how they evidence that their platform is secure um, and, and where that is hosted. Now, there's a webinar that we did earlier in, in March that's on our YouTube channel that talks around how software companies should be developing their code based upon the example of our, um, of our app, um, which will give you some more context, context there. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that, I uh, really Vaughn, fantastic. It's been you know really appreciate your efforts. You know, just um, talking about you, the program at NIST and sharing the LMS that you guys have developed. I think that's absolutely fantastic. I'm sure um, everyone who's who's watching this is going to be asking you questions <laughs> to see whether they can get a copy yeah. of that and just tailor it to their school. So um, I'm We're sure you're happy, happy to help. Yeah. reach out to you to sort of help them with any questions that they may have. Absolutely. Um, if uh, if if you don't mind, um, by all means, I've, I'm happy to share my email address. You can contact me. We're yeah, we're based in Bangkok. We're here, and we're we're going through this uh, piece by piece with everyone else. Brilliant. So um, thanks again, um, Andrew, uh, for your contribution. So I really appreciate you give a very clear overview of accountability. There's the next um, webinar, which is next Tuesday, on how to. Uh, protect and maintain the protection of personal data given the PDPA. Um, and there's going to be one last one. We're going we're to schedule a different webinar um, sometime in April, which will be like uh, um, uh, probably four people from the international schools community within within Thailand who have been working on their privacy programs for the best part of 12 months. So, um, uh, and, and where there'll be a far more, it'll, it'll just be Q&A for an hour for as many questions that you have. So first of all, for, so, 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 sorry, lastly, thanks again for your time and um, yeah. look out for the email. Thanks again, Vaughan, thanks Andrew, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Yep.
Same. Thank you, guys.